Hello, this is Political Forum uh, for Wednesday, July 17th, 2013. Uh, my name is Rod Joy, and I'm a proud board member here at CAN TV. And we're pleased to have as our guest today uh, Alderman uh, Maya Pawar from the 47th Ward. Uh, Political Forum is an opportunity for you, the viewers, uh, to have a direct conversation with your elected officials. Uh, it's an opportunity to learn about the aldermen, uh, issues and challenges facing the city, and above all, it's an opportunity to renew and reinforce the importance of civic engagement in Chicago. Uh, Alderman, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, maybe we could start, uh, if you could say a few words uh, to educate our viewers about the 47th Ward. Sure. So uh, my name is Amaya Pawar. I'm the Alderman of the 47th Ward. First, I want to say thank you for having me. Thank you to CAN TV. Um, it's my second time here, and it's a, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, the 47th Ward um, is made up of North Center, Lincoln Square, and Ravenswood. Um, it's, a great, it's a great community, um, and um, my office is located at 4243 North uh, Lincoln Avenue. Terrific. Um, maybe we could start by uh, sharing a little bit about how you got involved in politics and public service. What yeah. motivated you to run for office? I mean, I think it was a combination of factors, but I think, you know, um, like a lot of the new uh, aldermen and city council, the parking meter deal was certainly sort of the tipping point. And, um, you know, I think we were saying that you have this massive un, uh, pension liability and unfunded pension liability. You had um, a large structural deficits that went back to 2000, even when the economy was booming. Um, and then you have the parking meter deal and a number of other privatization deals. And so I think a lot of us, um, including myself, just decided, you know what, we're going to throw our, our hats in the ring and, and, you know, knock on doors. And, and I did that for a couple of years and just ran a grassroots campaign just talking about the issues and said, look, you know, sometimes to solve the complex issues, you just need to have a fresh set of eyes on the problem. Terrific. Uh, your calls are a, a major focus for our program. Uh, we invite you to call in, ask your questions, make your comments uh, to the aldermen. Uh, you can join us now. The phone lines are open. Dial 312-738-1060. Uh, 312-738-1060. Um, I would say uh, you've done a few things that are I would consider to be bold moves or things that fly in the face of what you might consider uh, Chicago politics. Uh, you made a pledge to not seek uh, re-election after two terms. Mm -hmm. uh, you also, I, I think, uh, return half of about half of your salary. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you approach public service and view public service? Yeah, so you know, I ran on this campaign pledge that I would reduce um, about half of my salary for the first year while I was in office, um, and that I pledged two terms. A lot of it was just it's just simple. The city was in a tough place. And I thought, you know, um, it was important to share in the sacrifice. Um, tough sacrifice. Like it was a tough year to, uh, uh, for me personally. Um, but I think ultimately it was it was a good decision. And I think that the, when it comes down to two terms, it's just I think it's good to have turnover. I think it's good to have, I think, stability for, you know, eight years. But I think beyond that, I think it's always good to have new eyes on the problem. You know, just because I think I can do a good job doesn't mean someone couldn't do it better. Terrific. Um what would you say is the job of an alderman? What, what's your what's your role in the city? So, I mean, I think it um, it it's a little bit different every day, but I mean, I think first and foremost, it's to make sure that, that, that the nuts and bolts, the basic services in, in the community are taken care of. And then I know we're starting to centralize some of these services and, you know, when, when it comes to grid garbage and make things, you know, more efficient and re go away from ward-based uh, service delivery. But, you know, my job is to be the quality control sort of agent. And then, you know, the second piece uh, or part of this job that I think is extremely important is, is, is being a legislator. And, you know, I've, I've had the uh, opportunity and the privilege of working with uh, the mayor and some of my colleagues. We've passed four major pieces of citywide legislation, and we've got a couple more um, that we're working on, the TIF Accountability Ordinance and the Independent Budget Office, which I think, uh, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully we, we can get some traction in the coming months. Terrific. I think we have a caller on the line. Caller? Thank you very much for taking my call. Um, I wanted to speak with the alderman because I have a concern about concealed carry having come to Illinois. Um, I don't think that guns really help to solve anything but only escalate um, already tense situations. And I just don't wanted to get your thoughts on firstly concealed carry being legal in Illinois. Uh, I'd, I'd like to hear about the assault rifles ban the city council passed today. And I'm also curious to know what other steps if any, the council plans to take in order to keep the citizens of Chicago safe. 
That's a really, really good question. So let me start with your last one first. Um, the reason why we cannot take more aggressive action on guns in the city of Chicago, it's because uh, not only the state of Illinois has removed the city of Chicago's ability and its home rule powers to legislate on certain things. That we can't legislate on labor law, we can't legislate on guns. Um, and this new conceal and carry bill that was just passed in Springfield limits our ability to um, strengthen our gun laws or uh, to pass new ones. So here's a, here's a few factors. One, the problem in Chicago is not guns, it's illegal guns. Now, I'm not a fan of guns, I can't stand them. Um, but I recognize that people believe in their Second Amendment right, and, and you know, that's fine. Uh, it, I, I personally would like to see an amendment to the Constitution because it certainly wouldn't be the first time we amended the Constitution after it was outdated. That said, I think um, we need the federal government to take action. But the problem is the NRA has contributed $32 million to federal campaigns. That's in 2012 alone. And what they do is they distort democracy by doing that. They make it nearly impossible to move anything out of the House of Representatives and pass any sort of real meaningful legislation. And then at the state level, the NRA has its political influence as well. You know, and, and they passed a bill that limits the city of Chicago's ability to keep uh, guns out of uh, restaurants that serve alcohol, that, keep, uh, that prevents us from outlawing uh, armor-piercing bullets, cop killer bullets. And so, you know, we're going to do what we can in the city of Chicago, which is why we passed the assault weapons ban. Uh, we passed the uh, school safety zone ordinance today. We do what we can, but the problem is other levels of government are failing us. And that's largely due to the NRA's influence. You know, money is power in this country, and money equals voice. That's what the Supreme Court decided. And if money equals voice, voice equals power, and power writes laws. And right now, the NRA is writing the laws. Terrific. Thanks for your call. Uh, this is Political Forum. It's a live, interactive call-in show. Uh, our special guest today is Alderman Pawar from the 47th Ward. Uh, please call in with your questions and comments. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the issues and what you focus on. Um, I, you know, there's some people who have described you as a lawmaker that thinks globally, acts locally. Uh, I know that there are issues that uh, you've weighed in on that are not limited to uh, the boundaries of your ward, or in mm -hmm. fact, the boundaries of the city of Chicago, and uh, talk a little bit about um, the, the, your thought process or decision-making process. How do you decide the issues that you'll take action on? I mean, uh, you know, for me, I, I take action or speak out on issues that you know I care about, um, that I, that my constituents care about. But you know, I think, look, issues related to the environment impact all of us. So while I may represent the 47th Ward, uh, you know, a slice of the city of Chicago. Certainly what happens around Chicago impacts my constituents. But what happens in and around the city of Chicago also impacts us as well. So I'll give you an example. You know, the, the Evanston City Council is currently uh, considering um, selling off public parkland um, on the beach for a fraction of what's, what it's worth. You know, here in Chicago, we think of the Burnham Plan, uh, our Lakefront Protection Ordinance as something that's set in stone. Evanston has similar legislation and a similar plan to protect the lakefront. My worry there is if, if Evanston sells off public parkland, beachfront, that what's to stop developers, you know, developers like Colonel Pritzker and Tawani Enterprises, um, the group that's proposing a project in Evanston, to come to Chicago and say, you know what, Chicago, you're in trouble too. You're not using all of your lakefront. Why don't we turn some of the lakefront into hotels? We'll generate tax revenue for you and everyone wins. And I think, look, the lake is sacred. It's sacred for all of us and it's for everybody, regardless of whether you're whether you're from the north side or the south side or whether you're from Evanston or the North Shore, it's for everybody. And, you know, I speak out on issues like that because you don't want to have a creeping effect of what happens in Evanston, you know, could impact Chicago. And, you know, we're one state. Do you get feedback uh, from your constituents when you speak out on issues that uh, are outside of the ward or outside of the city? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, sometimes you, you, people say, look, you know, you should be focused on only what's happening in the war. And I think a lot of my constituents appreciate the fact that, you know, we speak out on global issues because I think a lot of the, a lot of times, uh, you know, they want to work with me on those issues. But I think more importantly, I'll give you another example, fracking. It's something that we're hearing about all over the state. Now, people might say, well, that doesn't really impact the 47th Ward of the city of Chicago. Um, and, and, and it does. You know, there's evidence that suggests that Fracking can lead to uh, an increase in, in seismic activity. You know, we, we, you know, Southern Illinois sits on one of the largest fault lines. 
in the country. And so if we're fracking in southern Illinois and that could lead to an earthquake, certainly that's going to impact Chicago and we should be speaking out against that. So, you know, um, my job is to be a leader and to look at issues that impact us, not just in the ward, but across the city and across the state. And, you know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. So you're looking at issues that impact the, the ward, the city and the state. Um, and, and you're a lawmaker, you're a policymaker, um, but your office also receives a number of service related calls. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you balance your time in terms of responding to constituent needs and service related calls and being a, a legislator and a lawmaker? Is that an easy balance for you? I mean, I think it can be challenging, but I have an incredible staff and an incredible team. And, um, you know, we put the priority on our constituents and, you know, we work with them. Um, you know, and from time to time, you know, sometimes you know, the ball gets dropped. But the reality here is if, if you call us, if you email us, we're going to try to get back to you within 24 hours. We may not always have the answer or the right answer or the good answer, um, but we're going to try to get you an answer and then, you know, f correct problems as they come up. But the constituent always comes first. Terrific. I think we have another caller on the line. Caller, are you there? Yes. My question is uh, to the alderman, what is the situation facing the city pensions that could implode in another 10 years. What is the alderman and the mayor working on this particular uh, issue? That's another good question. So there's a, there's a number of pension systems. Uh, there's police and fire pensions will likely impact Chicago taxpayers next year. I'm sorry, at the end of next year and going into the 2015 fiscal year because unless we start uh, looking at pension reform for police and fire, the uh, Chicago residents um, could likely see a tax increase, a property tax increase of 50 to 90 percent. Now that's on 26 percent of their tax bill, meaning the city's share, but that's not insignificant. So, you know, the mayor is laser focused on getting pension reform. Right now, you're seeing the impacts of pension, a lack of pension reform on, on Chicago public schools. We've got a billion dollar structural deficit and roughly half or more is is due to the fact that we couldn't come up with pension reform. But let me be clear, pension reform doesn't mean we're for busting pensions. And I don't think any parent would say they want to bust the retirement plans of teachers, you know, teachers who essentially raise their children, right? So I think what, we're, I think what we need is a compromise. And the problem with, with um, the way things are playing out right now, and you see what the governor just did with suspending pay, whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, is that... There's a lot of political jockeying, and I don't think that the unions and the lawmakers are seeing eye to eye. And I think at some point we got to avoid this fiscal cliff situation and get a compromise because I think people are just sick and tired of waiting. Terrific. Thank you, caller. I think we have another caller on the line. Are you there? Hi, Alderman. Um, Hi. I know that you created the Asian American Caucus, and I just wanted to know what are your goals for that caucus? Another great question. Um, so there's a there's a couple goals. One being, um, you know, it's a, it's formalizing a lot of work that my colleagues have been doing in their community for many years. In some cases, decades. See Alderman O'Connor and Lorino, uh, Alderman Solis and Balso represent significant Asian populations, and they've been working with the community. But what we wanted to do is break down the silos and kind of work in a more cohesive manner. And I think one immediate goal of ours is to work with the mayor's office and the Office of New Americans to pass a, um, a, a comprehensive language access ordinance. So that means that, for example, today when you call 911 and if you speak Hindi or Arabic or Korean, you get hooked up to a language bank and that language bank translates your emergency uh, request to the, to the 911 dispatcher. But if you are a Indian business owner who only speaks Hindi and English is your second language, and uh, you want to call and complain about you know something that's happening in the city, you don't have access to a language bank. Um, and part of that is due to the fact that you know city government needs to evolve to the communities that it represents. And so, one thing that we would like to work on with the caucus is to look at language access issues across all city departments, and do a better job of making sure that you know if English isn't your first language that you aren't uh, ignored when it comes to being able to access your city government. So we've got to adapt. And I think, you know, the mayor stated over and over again that he wants to make uh, Chicago the most immigrant-friendly city in the world. I'm sorry, in the, in, in the country. And I think probably in the world, too. I think he'd agree with that. It's that, um, you know, we, ha we as a city have to make sure that people can, you know, 
do simple things like talk to a city inspector in an appropriate language or at least get translation services. Terrific. Uh, this is Political Forum. It's a live, interactive call-in program. Uh, our guest for today is Alderman uh, Pawar from the 47th Ward. Uh, Political Forum is an opportunity for you to have a direct conversation with your elected officials. Uh, we'd love to hear your questions and your comments. Please join us, 312-738-1060. I think we have a caller on the line. Caller, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, good evening, Alderman. Hi. I have a question concerning the uh, Divi bikes and the uh, new bike lanes. Uh, it seems that they're growing in popularity, and I, I love the idea and having the bike lanes, but it seems that pedestrians and uh, drivers aren't getting used to it. I saw two people on Divi bikes almost get run over today and another one who's riding along on the sidewalks. So are you concerned about this? Yeah, I mean, I'm concerned. I'm on my bike all the time, and, you know, it's frightening on some streets. Um, I think, look, this is sort of coming to a head because I think, you know, drivers feel like they're under attack um, because they feel like they're, that the city's making it harder uh, for them to get around. And, you know, my response is, is I don't think we're trying to, uh, you know, assault, uh, put down an assault on drivers, but I think what we want to do is look at livability in the city. And that means we have to make things more pedestrian friendly, more bike friendly. Um, that's what, you know, the creative class, the new college graduates are looking for when they think about where they want to move to. And so if we're going to grow as a city, I think livability has to be a big component of that. That said, I think um, I think drivers complain a lot about uh, cyclists not following the law. And there's a lot of that going on. But I think drivers also have to take into account that, you know, they're texting and driving, they're talking on the phone. So it's a two-way street. Um, so building this culture of kind of awareness around one another is going to take a little bit of time. And so we passed an ordinance in city council, I believe a couple months ago, that addresses this issue. One, that uh, creates programs to build awareness. Um, but secondly, also looking at ticketing, not only drivers, but also cyclists to kind of build that culture in. And, you know, we're hoping to create a positive environment so we're not just being punitive. Uh, but I think some of this... Uh, is just going to take a little bit of time and it's and it's frustrating but the good part is you know when i drive past i live right by the lawrence metro stop uh when i drive past there from time to time or when i ride my bike there there's hundreds of bikes that are parked out there now um and that wasn't the case a couple of years ago so i think we're starting to see a larger trend people getting out of their cars and riding their bikes more um but some of this unfortunately is just a matter of kind of get people getting used to one another Perfect. So we've had calls on gun control, the Divi Bike Share Program, the new uh, Asian American uh, Caucus. Uh, Alderman, you talked a little bit about making government more efficient, and uh, you know you've been known as a an open data guy, and the uh, importance of leveraging data to improve government efficiency, and that's been part of your brand even before you joined the city council. Can you say a few words about the importance of data, how data can inform how Chicago? Uh, serves its constituents. Yeah, I mean, look, there's lots of data that the city collects, um, and we should be using it to make smarter decisions about how we budget, how we allocate resources, how we deliver services. And I think we've started to do that. Um, we have uh, John Tolva in the mayor's office, and um, uh, you know Brett Goldstein, who just left. Who, they were looking at um, predictive analytics, and so one of the things that they're working on is let's take all of this data that exists normally that exist in silos and let's connect the dots so we can make better sense of what's actually happening in government so for example um, you know if you're starting to see uh, streets wear down much quicker than a, a street that's near the street that's wearing down you might want to take uh, a second look and look at traffic patterns and are there ways to divert traffic off of that one street and put it onto another street so that you're not refer resurfacing the same street over and over again um, service requests. Are you looking at things like if, if a single block is reporting low water pressure over a given period of time? You know, that might, that might be a leaky water main, but when you're looking at um, each service request in isolation of one another, you may not be able to connect the dots. And that's the whole point of open data, um, is to be able to work the data and help it work for you. And I think, you know, we, we created an app, uh, Chicago Works, that uh, sits on top of the Open 3 in one platform. And I think if you look at what the mayor's office is doing with John Tolva, um, I mean, they've, it's it's amazing. And I think, really, we're the leader in the country right now. Terrific. I think we have another caller on the line. Are you there? Uh, yeah, um, I was just calling about the open data stuff. Like, I, I have been interested in that for a while. 
But I wonder if you've seen much engagement in your ward or from people using these apps, because I feel like you know, the tech community and people in government get really excited about it. Mm -hmm. And then I, I don't know how much actual traction is gaining in the community. So, uh, you know, I think the app that we created, um, I think has probably been downloaded three or 4,000 times at this point. We've got a, few, a couple thousand active users. Um, but, I mean, I think the, the, the real potential of open data is not just the service request app. I think, you know, developers, and if you're a developer, I think you guys are going to be able to unlock a lot of things when you look at this data and when you put it together, when you mash it up, when you separate it and figure out how, um, how government can do a better job. Because I can tell you that, you know, we have some ideas, but I think the true potential is still out there. And I think we're waiting for really smart people to come together and start looking at this data and, and making sense of it and help inform us. And I think, you know, at some point, someone's going to figure out how to monetize this stuff. You know, and, and as a result, you know, for better or for worse, it's going to create a lot of jobs and it, it could be a, uh, an economic development tool. So I think there's a lot of really interesting possibilities out there with open data. Um, I think it's just in its infancy. But I think when I was just talking about what John Toll was working on with predictive analytics, I think that is going to be amazing. Terrific. One of our <laughs> earlier callers mentioned pensions, which mm -hmm. is uh, arguably the, the most significant issue facing the city, facing the state. Uh, it has a big impact on our budget. Uh, you, you've been in the news uh, recently uh, around a push for an independent budget office. Uh, can you say a few words about this Office of Independent Budget Analysis and why you think that would be a good move for Chicago? Yeah, so I introduced this ordinance to create an Office of Independent Budget Analysis, I believe is last December. And uh, the purpose or the goal is to really create, um, ensure that city council is a co-equal branch of government that you know that when there is a policy proposal that's put forward either by the mayor or by city council um, there is independent independent analysis of that proposal so that you know when the parking meter deal came out you know we have the resources to study it alongside with the mayor's team so that we can make an, uh, a more informed decision um, when, we, when we're ready to vote so um, this this ordinance this office is uh, uh, the the ordinance is still sitting in committee and you know uh, I'm optimistic that you know we can continue plugging away and kind of building political will around it and um, you know we'll see in the coming months whether there whether something wh whether we can get it to move but you know this is a commitment of mine it's a long-term commitment it's it's an important initiative um, and there's only two other cities in the country that have similar offices Pittsburgh and San Diego so you know we're hoping you know, along with my colleagues Michelle Smith and, and uh, Pat Dowell you know to build momentum to build buy-in and move this to, uh, to move this initiative but again, like a lot of big initiatives, some of the sometimes they take time. Great. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, in the program uh, the role of money in politics, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Representative Barney Frank famously stated, uh, "Politics is the only profession where you're required to take money from strangers and pretend like you don't owe them anything." Um, curious if you could elaborate a little bit more on your view about money in politics and whether you think that money power now trumps people power when it comes to influence. Well, I think certainly um, when you think about issues related to guns, I mean, you see the influence that the NRA has at the federal level. You know, we can't pass a single bill out of Congress um, on anything related to guns. And you see the $32 million trail, right? That's what the NRA put into the federal elections in 2012. So you can certainly see how money plays a major role. But, I mean, I have to be honest. I'm, I'm a politician. I have to raise money. Um you have to raise a lot of it and I you know I don't I didn't like doing it at first and I like it now because I think part of what I have to do is you know in order to um, to make sure that you are considered to be a good alderman you have to show that you have political support and then and I think it just comes with the job but I think ultimately what we have to figure out is you know money shouldn't equal voice and I think that's where Citizens United uh, you know distorts the entire system and I think what we need to do is figure out how to do put in campaign uh, contribution limits. But, you know, I don't have all the answers. I know, you know, money's part of politics and raising money's a part of it, so. Alderman, we have about 30 seconds left in the program. We really appreciate you joining us today. Do you have any final thoughts for our, our viewers? I would, uh, you know, pay close attention to what's happening around fracking around the state. I think it is going to present not only just eco potential ecological disasters, but also, um, where it could seep into our groundwater and drinking water, um, but that it would also um, create um, 
the possibility for greater natural hazards, disasters, that is, earthquakes. And I think we should be aware of that, and we should be following what's happening in Evanston and on the lakefront. You know, we shouldn't be eroding um, our assets, our, our natural assets, for, for profit. And I think it's something that's a major concern of mine, and I hope people pay attention. Terrific. You've been watching Political Forum. It's a live interactive program and a service of Can TV. It's your opportunity to connect directly with uh, your elected officials. Uh, thank you for watching. We invite you to join us next week, Wednesday, uh, at 7 p.m. for our next edition of Political Forum. Thank you.